Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brian Vigno. I just want to give him a quick introduction. Um, Mr. Vigno has been an investigator for the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. He's the head investigator for the Human Trafficking Division since January 2014. His investigations mainly involve human sex trafficking with success in obtaining several convictions. Um, his duties also include special assignments in rape and murder investigations. He was an FBI special agent for 31 years with investigations um, with investigative areas of experience including computer crime, internet crimes against children, internet and domestic terrorism. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, they opened up this position for me after I retired from the FBI. Uh, McGinty had this notion to start uh, I have somebody specialized in human trafficking. So uh, rather than go home and work on my golf game, I thought I'd do something worthwhile in life. And it's very fulfilling. I, I, I can't tell you, I, I'm having, it's more fulfilling than my, my career at the FBI, which was awesome. But, uh, so now I'm in this realm of uh, human trafficking and uh, I'm finding, you know, Cuyahoga County, this is my jurisdiction, and the sex trafficking is mainly what I'm working in. There's numerous cases, so many cases, you know, that I have to put stuff on back burners and halfway decent cases that I put on back burners because I got more important ones on, on the front burner. And every week I'll get a new potential lead, whether it be from Crime Stoppers, whether it be from uh, Drug Court, whether it be from uh, Human Trafficking Docket that Marilyn Cassidy has, uh, um, wherever. Uh, and and so I have to sort through all this and I, I'll try to I'll work with the sheriff's office um, has some guys and, and different departments. I'm trying to the FBI. I'm working with um, uh, uh, them on this, too. And so um, there's a ton of work. So it's not like this. Well, how much is there? It, it could we could outfit a, a large unit of, of investigators. But one thing I want this a mentality of the pimp. This is a, I don't recommend you buy this book because you give credit to the pimp who wrote it. You'll get the royalties on it, but uh, uh, it, it's very true as to what's going on in the head of the pimp and what he thinks. I wanted to highlight a couple uh, points in his, uh, in the index of this. No, a prey on the weak is the first arrow up there. And this is, they know how to walk into a room and find a vulnerable person. This is written in Biology 101. This is uh, one of the laws playing on the weak. Um, and in, in the Cleveland case, the case that I've seen, it's the heroin addicted women. Uh, the heroin addicted women, their mothers were crack addicted women. And now they are heroin addicted women. And, and these, these pimps that I've worked uh, in this area are the heroin dealers, heroin and crack dealers. And uh, we were moving more towards heroin, and uh, and these are their customers. Uh, and these these women are their heroin addicted customers. And now uh, this pimp realizes he can utilize them. Uh, they're they're going to owe him. These girls owe him money for the drugs. He can manipulate them now to put them up on the back page. And he'll run the operation, uh, and all they do is try to keep them getting sick each day. They live for uh, not being sick. And so the doctor is this heroin dealer who provides them enough to keep them from getting sick. And they, they don't like, I've interviewed lots of these women and uh, it breaks your heart because they don't, they have, have no family to go back to. Um, and their mother was crack at it. And uh, this is generally true. I mean, I, I hate to generalize, but it, it's, it's, it's crazy. But, um, so this pimp takes advantage of that. And um, uh, they don't want to do the prostitution. They hate it. They have to get, uh, they have to get high to, uh, to deal with it. Some of them get so high that they'll pass out during uh, you know, their uh, date. But uh, they hate it. OK, oh, sorry, I don't want to skip too much. They see, so pray on the week, avoid gorillas or Godzillas. You know, that's a rule. but. Um, most of the ones that I work with these, they call them gorillas because they beat the women up. And, um, uh, and that's a rule against, that's against the rules here because that'll attract 
the police and it'll, it'll get you busted. Uh, so it's a rule to don't be a gorilla and don't hang around with other people who are gorillas because it'll put the heat on you. Oh, oh, upstairs. oh okay, sorry. sorry. Sorry upstairs. I like to... I can fill the room with my loud, obnoxious voice down here, but okay. Um, and ain't no love in this shit is what the, uh, the one chapter is because they have to avoid, they, they want these, deceive these women. They want, each one of them thinks that they're the, uh, the girlfriend of the pimp. And uh, he's eventually, once they earn enough money, they're gonna go off together and, and, uh, and live together with the money that they earn. And she's number one. And she suspects he's having sex with all the other girls, and he is. But um, he's able to, through his smooth talking, uh, able to convince her that uh, she's the number one. So she hangs out with it. But in his mind, ain't no love in this. It's all a deception. Because he's not, uh, this is a business for him. It's ain't no love. Um, the third arrow, uh, get, a, get you a bottom bitch. This is the woman who is, uh, runs all the other women. And um, he can play the nice guy and have her play the, uh, uh, the tough one in order to, you know, get the money from the girls. Uh, uh, just keep things straight. So generally speaking, there's a top woman, which they call the bottom, um, uh, that runs the operation. Get in the hose head. It's all about manipulation. <clears throat> Uh, play one hole against the next. You know, well, she's earning. She's able to earn. She must be better looking, or she must be uh, better at this because uh, she's getting a thousand dollars a day, and I'm only seeing four hundred dollars a day from you. Um, so you you have them compete with each other, and uh, and they'll confide in the pimp, and not necessarily confide, particularly when it comes to money, in the other girls. She doesn't want the girls ganging up on him. Okay. So I've got uh, four cases I want to walk you through. Um, this is kind of the best way to, to see the reality of what's going on here. And it, some of you have seen my presentation, but I've added, as time goes on, I'll, uh, as we get new cases, I'll add to it. Buddy Love was the first one. Uh, this is Buddy, and he, he put himself up on back page as, as a named uh, Tylon. And he was selling uh, some cars and things like this. He was familiar with the uses of Backpage. Um, he lived in, uh, in the border of Cleveland and East Cleveland, which I'll show you. That's his house. Bottom line is uh, we got a complaint um, for a missing person. And it was routed to the sheriff's department. And then I was with the Jay Haddam, a sheriff that I work with. And um, so we were looking into this missing person. And they had a location uh, on this Forest Hill Avenue. And so I did some surveillances down there and the guy caught me one time driving down there. What am I doing down in that neighborhood? Uh, Cause he was on a dead end street and I'm driving and uh, he happens to pull up in his SUV and he's got two women in the back and he, he's looking, he puts, he gets a window down and he's, he's trying to talk to me and I'm telling him like I'm, oh, I'm, just, oh, I'm lost. Uh, and uh, I fit in that neighborhood. But uh, fortunately for me, he was selling a vehicle and, and so I was gonna, in case I had to pretend like, oh, I was looking for this car that he had for sale. It was some hot rod that, uh, took a special fuel to uh, run the engine. Um, but the guy turned around and he starts following me in this SUV and I don't want to blow the case. This is like three days in the case. And you, you don't want him to smell a rat immediately because then he'll close up shop. Throughout this investigation, I wanted him to act normally. Now, the pressure is, I don't know how many victims are in his house. So you can't let something go on, uh, particularly as, you know, if it was an, an un underage kid. So you have this balancing act where uh, as soon as you get the probable cause, you have to go into this place, but you need the probable cause first. And, and you don't wanna blow the investigation by uh, heating up the neighborhood. And usually these people have their neighborhood pretty much covered. They know neighbors and they, they, uh, they, when they smell a rat, which is the, uh, the police, um, they'll change their lifestyle. And then all of a sudden it's harder for me to make a case because ultimately I wanna catch him red handed. I wanna catch him bringing the girl to a hotel, which we did in this case. Uh, now this was one of the girls, um, her advertisement, you know, back page is the current method of, uh, you know, advertising. Um, they used to be Craigslist and, and there still is some on Craigslist. And, um, you know, everybody is up in arms of back page, they disgust me, why don't they shut it all down? And uh, um, now, 
look, if you go to Backpage.com, you can buy a lawnmower, you can buy uh, uh, anything. You can get a painter for your house. You can uh, buy whatever. And there happens to be an adult section and there happens to be escorts. And it's based on city, too. I mean, it's really broken down. This morning, if you looked, went on Backpage and went into adult services and you went to escorts, uh, just since 12.01 a.m. this morning, I bet there'll be maybe 30 ads that were just posted since 12.01 this morning, because as the day goes on, people post, and, uh, and uh, you look into the recent posts, if you're a, a, a John, um, and, and you go, and, you, and that's the way they put. So the girls post maybe two times that day because they want to be on the top of the list. Um, but back to this back page issue, uh, I'm not sure how I perceive this because uh, um, there's been met, uh, uh, people determined to shut Backpage down. Um, all I can tell you is when, when we serve Backpage with a, a subpoena for records, we get it pretty quick. And it's, it's one of the methods that I use to uh, develop my investigation is look at the extent of this particular phone number that's advertised on Backpage, look at the extent of their uh, time, uh, well, how, how, because I'm trying to determine how many victims there are and, um, and how, how long has this been going on? You know, I get these leads and I have to, which ones are the most important ones? Which ones has the most victims or not? This is one method. And Backpage responds and they give us this stuff and I'm able to chart it out. I'll have, I'll have 400 pages of ads that have been uh, for a variety of, of women, but now I can, I start to put this piece together. If, if they take Backpage down, it'll go overseas and then we, we won't get any of that information. I mean, if it goes overseas, we have no jurisdiction to um, necessarily to be able to get it. So that, that's the only problem with that. And I, I, I'm, I'm torn uh, on it. But just be aware of that. But so now, uh, she's not advertised in, you know, in lingerie or anything. Some of them do that. She happens to not be. But this would be a typical back, a back page ad. Uh, it's get, they have to have a phone number, so uh, the the, uh, the woman always has to have a phone that uh, where John's call in. Uh, in this Buddy Love case, there were my victims. Now, um, they weren't all in the house when we went in and did the search, um, uh, but they were in and out of that house over a period of uh, of a couple of years. And uh, a key for me, of course is to interview these victims to let them know that I'm not gonna jack them up and get them in jail on some drug charge or uh, solicitation charge. No, I perceive them as victims, which they are, which is, is somewhat um, unusual, uh, hard to get through to a lot of law enforcement officers. They've, over the years, they've seen them as they're soliciting, they're gonna give them a ticket for soliciting and that's it. And, um, uh, but in the human trafficking arena, you have to work a case and you, it takes time to delve into it and, uh, and, and see the extent of this operation as opposed to just quickly giving a solicitation ticket to someone and walking away from it because a lot of police departments don't have the ability to uh, dedicate someone several months to look into one particular case. And so they just do the quick thing and, and move along. But uh, so that's where I come in, in the prosecutor's office, and I try to take these cases that the police maybe have uh, 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 developed for maybe a car stop, and there was an underage kid in the car, and, and they don't have the time to dig into that. But now I have the ability to spend some more time and dig into this, look at cell phone records, look at back page advertisements, develop this case, and I'll start interviewing witnesses. Now I got these witnesses that I have to try to get to trial and try to come to court. This could be a project as well, um, because they're afraid, particularly for a gorilla pimp who uh, who uh, threatens them. There's with the bottom and the bottom's daughter. They were both co-defendants in the case. She was, uh, you know, on back page herself too, working for her father, and um, uh, and. Uh, the, old, the older woman was, of course, once addicted to heroin and was going through treatments to come off of it, but she was acting as the bottom. She uh, testified on, on my behalf, on our behalf. So this was a general pattern in this case. He's got heroin using customers, he's a dealer, he invites them to the house. Now what this particular scumbag would do, he actually increased a lot of their heroin use because he wants to manipulate them. He wants to get them 
more addicted than they were as his original customer. Come to my house, you can stay there. A lot of them don't have places to stay or they go from one drug house to another. Now he's offering him a, them a place to stay, plus he's gonna provide the heroin that they need on a daily basis. Um, so it's somewhat attractive for, for them to have a place to stay and live and not have to be searching around for uh, a dealer all the time. Uh, but he, he, this, that piece of crap increasing their heroin use so he can manipulate them better and he can control them now. He can control them. If, he, if he's mad at them, he doesn't give them the amount that they need so they get sick. And uh, so he manipulates them completely uh, based on the amount of heroin he does or does not give them. They got to work off their debt. He, he, he fronts them the heroin and now they owe him. And uh, he puts them on back page. He takes away their personal phone because he doesn't want them to contact their family members or their old boyfriends or whatever. He's gonna, so he takes their personal phone and uh, gives them a little flip phone that uh, he'll provide them because he needs a number. They have to be able to get calls from the Johns. Um, and he, he would, if it's texting, he could act as the person pretending that he's her because she's passed out in his house on a living room couch and the, the calls are coming in. So he responds with the text message back to this John saying, oh yeah, I'm available. Are you, uh, are you at a hotel or you got an apartment or an in call or an out call? Um, in this particular case, he didn't have Johns come to this house. So the, the Johns had to either have a hotel or go to an apartment or a home or something. Um, but then, so he would arrange the date and then he'd wake up this woman who's passed out from, uh, from the drugs and uh, she may need a, another shot before she goes on this date. And then he drives her to the hotel or wherever and he waits for her. She collects her $130, what, depending on if it's, it's a 15 minute call, it may be $80. If it's a half hour call, it may be uh, 130 or something like that. And, uh, and there's no restrictions on him as far as the type of sex. Um, uh, you know, any, any, any gamut, the whole gamut of a type of sexual activity. Um, prophylactics are generally provided uh, by the pimp. Um, he screens the incoming calls, he drives them to the dates, he takes all the money. Uh, as you'll see here, I've got some videotapes of, uh, uh, of one of the girls talking. And when she first went to him, you know, they were gonna split it 50-50. And, uh, Okay, but then by the time she buys dope from him, pays him for the drive, uh, to drive her to the date, um, he ends up with all the money. And it only took her like two dates worth, or two, two, two days living with this guy to realize he's, he's getting all the money. And although the original deal was 50-50. And then he's got to make sure that he don't hide the money. So he'll occasionally, if he's got, if he's got five women in the house, and he, and the, so they come back from, a, a couple of them come back from the dates, he'll have to strip search them completely, look in every orifice to make sure they're not hide money. And if, God forbid he finds money because he'll beat the crap out of them in front of the others. So the others will be intimidated and never do this. And this has happened. Uh, that's what a gorilla pimp does. Okay, uh, this is an interview. Um, this is very moving to me. I did this interview with that, the one girl that I showed you the back page ad for, and uh, she died a month later of an overdose in a hotel. So it's very, uh, it's very moving. Hopefully, can you manipulate it to get, okay, thank you. Because it, it's just different with different people. Um, when I first, when I tried to leave at first, he wouldn't let me leave. Okay. I mean, when I tried to leave a couple times, uh, he would not let me leave. I got my ass beat and he before I could leave. For was just before you left the first time? Uh, no, this, first two this days was after that. After. Um, there's different clips of this interview. Um, just to bring out certain points. Um, oh, he plays this mental game as we, uh, uh, he beats them down playing this mental game. Um, she gets comfort because she wants to avoid being sick. That's what she lives for. And when she wakes up in the morning, she has to plan on how to get her fixed so she's not sick. The sickness is you take your worst flu when you're achy, you're cold, you're hot, you're crapping all over the place, you're puking, you're uh, times 10. And that's the sickness. Um, and it depends on, on uh, the, the heroin addict. Sometimes it depends on the the level of heroin that they've been on as well. Uh, but 
It's horrible. And so she lives for this fix. That's why heroin addicts will steal from their own mother, uh, because they have to get this fix. And then she, so she says, sometimes I'd rather be out boosting and stealing shit to support my habit than, you know, than let him run my, you know, uh, let him have space in my head. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's more of a, you can't live with the whole you thing. Okay. You know what I mean? It's more yeah. the mental shit than it was. Oh, yeah, anything. yeah. Okay. It was more of like, you ain't shit without me. You can't be anything without me. You need me. Okay. You know, type thing. And that's what beat you down. Yes. Really, that's what beat you down. And is it that he's selling himself as being your protector? Or what, what is he? What's Sometimes. The, Sometimes he does. Like he said, when I came back, he's like, yeah, they always come back. I just, I, I learned to just let them go because the streets will beat the hell out of them. I don't got to do nothing. You know, they'll come back for protection okay. when they want it. And, and he's right to a certain extent, you know what yeah. I mean? It's the comfort, you know, when you get a junkie and, and they don't have to ever worry about being sick. That's the best promise you can give somebody like uh, me. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it, it does get tired. It really does. You get sick of it regardless if you're a junkie or not. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'd rather be out boosting and stealing shit to support my habit than, you know, to let him run my, oh, let you run, know, yeah. let him have space in my head. And, and All right, so are they captive? Uh, see, for me to make this human trip, look, I get all these leads and, and I have to, is there compelling involved? Are they slaves? I have, for, it, for it to come up to the level of human trafficking, I have to present that. I have to show that. A judge or a jury has to see that they are compelled I, for it to be human trafficking. I don't work prostitution cases. I work human trafficking. So, but I get these prostitution cases and I have, well, is, is there this human trafficking element? Is, are they compelled to do this? Are they slaves? Um, and that's what human trafficking is. Uh, so are they captive? Well, so I determined, based on the interviews, when they went in there, he took my cell phone. I said, so you didn't want me to contact him. Uh, I don't have any personal clothing. I got my date clothes and, and my sweats that they sleep in a house uh, with, but they don't really have possessions. Um, and the beatings are afraid of those repercussions. And then the, the guy plays with their head too, uh, that they're his, they're his girlfriend. Go ahead. How much money does she keep? Okay. See, when I went to back this time, I was just like, just a couple days ago, I was like, oh, I'll give you half. <laughs> I'll give you half. Yeah. And that's how it's going to be. Yeah, what right. Say? Okay. He said, okay. Uh. But he knew. Because I was going to have to buy my own dope. I was going to have to buy my own cigarettes, buy everything, just doing heads. It just wasn't Oh, work. okay, okay. He already knew. He knew it wouldn't work for a while. It worked uh. for a day. Ah, oh, okay. So this was his back door here. Uh, is it to keep the girls in? I think it was to keep the, uh, the cops out. But, um, but to try to do a raid on a door like that is it's quite tough. You can, you can use a ram all you want. SWAT can bang that all day. They need to cut through the door with a, with a, a saw. Um, okay, this is the last clip I'll play for you. But. What? Here's the thing. Between the girls, nothing's ours. We that, that's where I'm getting at. Nothing is ours. We own nothing. You know what I mean? If we want to go, we're shit out of luck because we have nothing. I see. That's part of the ploy. That's part of the way to keep you. Right. Oh, sorry. I did have one more on detox, but I, I think we're kind of running. Um, so th in this particular house, that was one of his back page ads there of one of the one of the other girls. Now I, when I went for the search, when we got the search, I went in and, and I found the same one. This is a nice court presentation uh, to show that these back page pictures advertising this uh, escort dates. And here's one of his, and now here's his house showing uh, the actual lighting. And this one as well, that was one of the other girls. That that is a back page picture. And then there is when I did the search and took that picture in the kitchen. Nice evidence. But this is what I, I have to have evidence to show this judge, to show that tie in these back page ads over a period of time to uh, these victims and to this guy's house. 
And then, of course, this is the big, you know, this was part of, you know, bottom line, this guy came to, we set up a date. We went to Orange, which, you know, Beachwood, right there uh, on the on highway there. And we called, uh, it was that girl that, uh, in the video, you know, who ended up dying. Um, but, uh, and just, so fortunately for me, Buddy Love drove her that day. Now, he doesn't always drive them. If he's available, he'll drive them. He could have his bottom drive them. And so we're doing this thing. I'm doing it with the sheriff's department. And we're, when we have it, I had a tracker on his car, too, so I could, or no, no, I, I didn't. I had his cell phone. I was GPSing his cell phone. So wherever his cell phone, every 15 minutes, I, if, if it was clear enough and could get a good read, I'd see where that cell phone was sent to an email that I had. And, um, so we knew he was coming, but uh, but we didn't see him in the vehicle. He was sitting in the back seat of the vehicle when the vehicle pulled in a lot. She comes up to the hotel room, and and uh, we we took that took the hotel room down, and then we went. Uh, there were guys out in the lot to take him down, and there he was. And there's all these. Now I've got uh, several cell phones strew, uh, thrown about in the um, in the in the uh, vehicle. And then uh, you go, when we do the search on this house, now, you know, this is a lot of forensic work. Each one of these phones has text messages and the call logs, and, and not all of them are current phones. Um, he's only, uh, you know, depending on how many girls happen to be working that uh, the last few months. Uh, but say, say there's at least five or six phones here that are going to be significant in the case. But you got to go through each one of them and have a forensic guy give you a DVD with all the contents of those and then go through them to find, uh, to get your evidence. Uh, oh, if you could hit this one. This is a pretty good summation of this case. Not unlike Ariel Castro. Uh, you put these women in bondage and you use them uh, sexually to enrich yourself. Old Man 5 tonight, just hours after Judge David Mattia compared Daryl McClendon to Ariel Castro for holding seven women as sex slaves. News Channel 5's Michael Baldwin is the only local reporter to speak with one of his victims. Yeah, Chris, the victim says he did it by using her addiction to heroin against her, forcing her and at least six others to sleep with men for money and a fix. I ended up being held there and prostituting and getting um, heroin. From him. We are covering the victim's face to protect her identity. We'll call her Jane Doe. She is one of at least seven women that were held as sex slaves by Daryl McClendon, otherwise known as Buddy Love. Every time I did try to leave, he would get really angry and then bribe me with heroin. The victim says she was held in this house on Forest Hills Avenue in East Cleveland, only allowed to leave when she was going on a date. She's a former heroin addict who was introduced to Buddy Love through another victim. Once she was there, she wasn't allowed to leave. Then she says he started advertising her on an adult website. If she didn't sleep with strange men, she couldn't get the heroin. It was very um, degrading, but I knew I had to do it if I wanted to feel better. I never did it sober. I was always high before I went and did it, so it helped to block out um, a lot. He drastically increased their heroin addiction. Prosecutors say Buddy Love gave women so much heroin that they couldn't go more than two hours without it. A lot of these pimps are former drug dealers themselves, and now they've moved to selling women. And whereas you can only sell a drug once and make your money off it once, you can sell a woman over and over and over. All right, the victim ended up getting away after she agreed to go on a date and she called her mom for help. As for McClendon, the judge gave him 15 years. We'll have on your side of Michael Baldwin. He's Channel 5. All new I'll just skip that one because uh, for lack of time, but um, that's my partner in the back to, with the crew cut. And that's Holly, uh, our prosecutor. She specializes in human trafficking, although she does a lot of the internet crimes against children stuff now. She still uh, is our main prosecutor for human trafficking. Another case I just wanted to uh, touch on, now this involves uh, the underage. Uh, for underage, I don't have to show compelling. If they're 15 years old uh, or younger, um, it's automatic. She's compelled because of her age. Uh, 
So this was Frederick Brown and, and his bottom. And he, um, he was busted in Independence Police, by Independence Police at a hotel. A hotel called the cops and says, you know, something smells here. And the, the cops had worked with this hotel uh, in the past. And so they had a relationship. To, uh, and uh, they didn't like what they saw with this guy in his van. And he had these two other young girls in the back of the vehicle. And so the cops uh, went on back page and they saw oh, in, added independence and uh, they saw a couple of them, well maybe, and, and it could be one of these. And so they actually did a traffic stop uh, with, with these two in the front seat and the two young girls in the back seat. And, uh, and then uh, while the one officer was talking to the girl in the front seat, the other officer dialed the back page number and it rang in the front seat. Uh, it's pretty good evidence. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and coincidentally enough, when we took the ho uh, hotel room down, there was another pimp in the hotel, this guy, who I had known. I had a, uh, uh, although we, I couldn't make a human trafficking case on him, he was with this uh, other unidentified at the time uh, woman who they were in a, a separate hotel room. Uh, and they were working together because they were going back and forth and taking pictures of each other to put up on back page and that. Um, I wasn't able to make a human trafficking case on, on him. He was, he was a gorilla pimp, and uh, I'm, inter I'm still interested in him, but I couldn't for this case. Those were the two girls. Now, there's their back page picture up top, 15-year-olds from uh, Scoville and East 55th area. There's a housing complex around there. And um, it's an eye-opener. Uh, you know, and then of course all the evidence that was taken at the hotel and, and the car. You will notice a little cigar box. It's usually uh, someone with their heroin kit, uh, with um, needles or, or a bloody uh, Kleenex. Uh, the young girls weren't doing the heroin. Um, so far, I haven't seen the underage girls on the drugs. They're just uh, um, living in bad situations uh, and, and wanting to earn money. And uh, the adult women I'm finding are the heroin addicts, but the underage are uh, just, they've been talked into this by the pimp to earn money so they can have this, uh, uh, so they can buy things that they like. Um, but their maturity comes out is in, in this particular trial. I only got one of the girls in the courtroom. The other one took off for, you know, out of state. And um, it's very difficult to get these people who are, are street people and they're street wise and they don't want to be uh, seen as a snitch in the community. And um, so it's extremely difficult to get, I need them as witness. I have to have them in there or the guy walks. And there's Frederick Brown and he got 13 years. Uh, I only had one of the victims come in, and she became a hostile witness. Now, fortunately, the night that they were arrested in Independence, I went down to the Independence Police Department. I took a statement from the two girls uh, at about 1 in the morning till about 3 in the morning. Um, and I had something. I had their back page ads, and I had, um, well, the back page ads. And they, and they wrote on their, this, this represents, and this, and I showed a picture of, uh, of the pimp and he, he blah, 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 and the very little statement. But unfortunately I did, it locked in what took place because when the one got on the stand, she denied that anything took place until we showed, well, isn't this, the, uh, Holly said, isn't this your, your statement? Well, yeah, it is, okay. Okay, so, so it did happen, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But she became a, this hostile witness that no one knew what to do with it. The judge, even the defense attorney and, and the prosecutor, she, I, I wanna get, I, I'm tired. I'm done with this, as she's on the stand. And, um, but it's, we're all like, oh my God, what's the judge gonna do here? Uh, but her maturity level really came out. This is a 15 year old girl. And, and that's what, and this pimp sitting over there, he took advantage of that. And um, so it really, but she needed to be there. Had, had she not been there, this guy would have walked. Uh, this is another case. Uh, you're familiar with the Travel Lodge Hotel on Brook Park Road. Uh, just got closed because, of, partly because of this case. Um, I mean, the guy that runs the hotel will 
he doesn't he's not in collusion with these people I mean, all he wants is his, his thirty two dollars each night for whoever's staying there because he'll kick the pimp out if the pimp doesn't pay the thirty two dollars that night um, but the pimp will have like three or four rooms. He'll have his main room that he lives in, and then he'll have rooms that the girls will uh, uh, have dates. It was a similar situation. These were a 20-year-old girls addicted to heroin that could come to the, he was a dope dealer. He's staying at this hotel. He says they can come there, they can work back page, um, they, can, they share rooms with us other girls, and uh, so they can live there and get their heroin without having to go anywhere but they have to go down back page. So, uh, you know, some of my evidence, of course, is his Facebook, well, not his Facebook page, but uh, so his, his bottoms Facebook page. And, uh, and there he is, and you can, you can look at the curtains and the uh, crappy air conditioning unit and know uh, you're at the travel lodge. And I, I hate to say it, but I, I can look at curtains now and tell you what hotel it is. <laughs> And I, I despise these places. I, I never want to go to a hotel. I don't want to go on a vacation because I don't want to go to a hotel room. <laughs> Even if it's a nice hotel room, and it disgusts me. But uh, this is the ultimate in disgust. But then he's going to display all his money. That's a nice court exhibit. Um, particularly when the date of the picture, which I took from a cell phone, the date of the picture matches a back page ad date. So it's circumstantial evidence that this money is from uh, the prostitution. But you get enough circumstantial evidence and it really like, it's in your face. And so there's a famous travel lodge, which he closed, I think it was last month they closed it. And uh, one of the main girls, that was her back page ad. We actually went into her hotel room and did a search, as you'll see. Now here we had the drug sniffing dog that responded. This is his room with his bottom. And the drug sniffing dog responded to that uh, drawer, which inside was, was some heroin and some narcotics. And then in her room, she had in the same middle drawer there, that little box uh, stationary. And inside you'll see three syringes. And she gave us consent. Um, and then this is what you have to watch out for. This is what cops have to watch. This is being a cop and searching somebody who's a heroin addict is very dangerous because somebody has a syringe in their pocket. And uh, the people at the hotel rooms, uh, they're cleaning a hotel room. Uh, I mean, you get poked by one of these things and you could get AIDS. And then you have to check every year for the, for the next 30 years to see if you have it. Because you, you were doing your job and you were searching this guy and you always ask, hey, do you have any needles or anything in your pocket? I said, oh, no, no, you know, or hospital workers or anyone that has to deal with uh, the potential for a needle. It's, it's dangerous. Uh, this guy, um, Isaiah, what, is it, what did I say there? How many years he got? Uh, 13 or 15 or 20, I, I forget now. Uh, now, this is another underage case. This was more recent. This guy, Mayfield Village, picks up this guy at 4 o'clock in the morning. They see this guy, and uh, they got enough to make a traffic stop. They make a traffic stop, and this guy's with this 15-year-old girl from Akron. He's also from Akron. And um, uh, this is a picture that she had on her cell phone, but uh, of which... I had the date, I actually had the GPS of, from the cell phone evidence. I had knew the GPS readings of where the picture was taken. So when I talked to her, I said, look, uh, and, you know, and I showed her a Google picture of the uh, GPS location. And so, so, you know, this is why it helps. You have to do your homework when you interview these people. And um, so I had this picture and she actually, uh, she identified it as to where it was. Um, now, I took these pictures, well, the, his first name was Stephen, and that was on his cell phone. I don't know that these, I never was able to prove that these girls worked for him or whatever. He may have just took this off the internet because his first name was Stephen. But this is common, the whole tattoo thing. Um, ownership. Um, uh, they want their women to have their stamp on their bodies, uh, whether it be in the form of, you know, on the right there, or, or a name. And um, that's a reality. It's disgusting. Because generally now they're going to get, get rid of it. Once they finally realize that this guy was just using them, now they stuck with this tattoo. Um, and this was her cell phone. This is 
like the report that I got off of her. Now, I put the blue things in there to cover up, naturally, uh, identities of people or, or something uh, disgusting or whatever. But, um, but just to give you an idea, the date and times, and then she's, has, as I'm receiving it, she sent him that picture to, for, for him to post on back page. So she texts him and she attaches it to a text and sends it to him on back page. And then it goes up on back page, that particular. And the, now, unbeknownst to her, this isn't back page, but the sexyservice.com, they go and they archive all the back page pictures. So for the rest of her life, for the rest of eternity, past her life, that picture of her that she posted on back page will be up on a sexyservice.com. Um, now you do the search. Uh, of course, on Northfield Road there in Warrensville Heights, that you know by the by the track there, there's three hotels and they're all these, you know, similar to the Travel Lodge. You know where you wouldn't want to sit on the bed. Of course, I, I never sit on a bed in any hotel room without taking that that cover off and uh, uh, and throwing that in a corner and um, and. I never used a coffee maker. Are you kidding me? Who, who, who put stuff in and the, and the, and the television? Uh, you better put this in a bag because they never wash these things. <laughs> what, between the buttons? Put this in a, put it in a glad bag. <laughs> you don't have to deal with that. <laughs> um, but they use the money cards. Money cards are evidence. They're, they're the, uh, you, know, you go to the gas station and you pay $20 for a card. It's only worth good for $20, but you can go on the internet and you can put up a back page ad and use that card. It's $20 and then you're done with it and they have to go buy some more. So uh, a lot of times at any, any scene of uh, the crime, you'll see 30 of these things uh, thrown about. Um, but that's good evidence for me. Thank, uh, one of these hotels, there was a, a girl that was recently shot and killed. She was... Um, she was on back page, and uh, a John had uh, uh, shot her and killed her. Okay, oh, now, uh, this particular case, then we'll get into questions. Um, again, it was an underage girl. She's in Akron. My jurisdiction is pretty much Cuyahoga County. I was, I was working with an FBI agent in Akron and also a detective uh, in Akron, but, but they're not, they got their own cases. And so it was very difficult for me to develop this case to its fullest capacity um, to make this human trafficking aspect. All the, all the other girls were in Akron. Uh, and and, and, she, and I, bottom line is, um, now she's on a run. I interviewed her almost immediately at a juvenile detention center. Then she's released and she's not staying at home. And she, but I, I managed to get her phone number because she was advertising on Backpage, working whether she was with a pimp uh, at this time may have been, I, I don't know. All I know is that she's my witness and she's on Backpage and this guy's trial is coming up. And so I uh, GPSed her phone and I found her at a house in Akron. And so I told the Akron detective, because she was wanted. Um, and so they went to that house and recovered her. Now, coincidentally enough, there was a shooting at that house with uh, somebody came in to, to rob the John uh, on a you know, long story. You know, these stories, they, they, you just keep digging. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. But um, that was her. That was my girl. Now, the guy ended up pleading guilty to attempted human trafficking. And the judge had the discretion and, the, and the, the pimp's mom got up there and laid on some sob story about him and and uh, uh he had just gotten busted in pennsylvania for the same thing it wasn't an underage but it was women he was running out there he got two years uh i'll take questions yes do you or someone else go out to the local police to train them or make them aware of the problem? Yes, uh, we, um, I, do, I do stings and uh, the local police and the jurisdictions that we do the stings, they'll be present for that. Um, and as far as training, we have, we have initiated that and I've been to some, um, thanks to efforts, uh, we, uh, training is a big part of this to get them to know me and know that, hey, give me your case and I'll work it with what you originally got. If you don't have a detective to handle that, I'll handle it. And that's, so 
slowly but surely word gets around. Yeah, go ahead. If I go to my local police department, can you give me a name or who should they contact? Oh, okay. Um, you got my name. Okay. Yeah. They could contact you. Oh, absolutely. All right. I'll gladly you. do that. Because I need, I want um, all these police departments to know that I will assist them in any way that I can. Uh, we can work together. I don't have to take the case from them. I'd rather have, you know, uh, I spent 32 years in the FBI, but I, I don't have, I'm not a, a official law enforcement officer. I'm concealed carry. But um, uh, so I, I would like to have an officer present with me in, in all the cases. And if it's out of their jurisdiction, if they want to, they want to, they put the time in. And I don't see your phone number anyplace, but I can talk to you later. Yes, yes. Thank you. I'll put some cards up here or something like that. Yeah. Anybody? It's, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, labor trafficking in Ohio has involved people from other countries. Is there any indication that's going on with the sex trafficking as well, or is, are you not seeing that? Well, um, I have some current cases that uh, involve, you know, the Asian massage parlor type things. Um, and um, they're difficult. Uh, they're compelling. The compelling portion, look, if I go into uh, take down a massage parlor and there's all these women and they have their own visas and, and IDs and their own cell phones, then that's an indication that they I have somewhat freedom. If they don't have control of their own visas and passports and, and they, they don't speak English and they're depending completely on this person who's gonna pick them up and take them to that business uh, uh, every day, uh, then that's more of, that shows that they're, um, I didn't even cover that, I don't think. Um, it shows that uh, they, they could be compelled to be doing this because they, they have no place to go, they, they can't even speak English. And so therein lies the difficulty, but just to give you a flavor of uh, the hardcore labor uh, stuff, I haven't gotten any cases yet. I'll gladly work it. I've got so many of these sex trafficking cases and, um, and so underage or people being beaten up, those are the front burner ones because someone, someone's being hurt. In all, in all cases are being hurt, but I mean, as far as a gorilla pimp is my, one of my first priorities and the underage kids. So Brian, this is a question from upstairs. Um, what risks of retaliation do trafficking victims face when there's witnesses in these cases against the traffickers? Well, uh, this is a big issue. And uh, in the cases that I've worked, the bad guy's in jail. So that helps. But he's going to be going to trial, and he may not get convicted. And it, plus, he has contacts on the outside. Now, most of the victims are under this impression that the pimp is well connected, and he's got people that'll, you know, it'll come up with a baseball bat, or you know, or come in and and kill, you know, anyone that testifies against him. And, and I listen to their jail calls. I pretty much most of these guys can't even get people to come down and put twenty dollars on their books in jail, um, and so, and they're calling mommy from from jail in order to get the relatives uh, get money together so they can get out on on, on bond or something to that nature. Uh, it's not to say that these pimps don't have connections, but um, it's an issue for me. Absolutely, it's a big issue, and uh, that's why I bought myself a Benelli shotgun, and uh, I'll protect them. <laughs> You've given us a good uh, description of the pimps, the victims. Can you give us some sort of a profile of the clientele? Victims? Oh, the Johns. The Johns. Okay. It's a good question. Uh, the whole gamut. I, uh, uh, from a Case Western Reserve University student from uh, from a car dealer, from, uh, you know, the whole gamut. I, I, I've i only been in on one sting where I was opening a door and the John knocking on a door and then I open up and I just open it up and then the, the guys from the Sheriff's Department push him in and get him out of the way and, and, and handle him. And uh, so you get guys that are <laughs> 
to, uh, are you kidding me? You know, so uh, all walks of life, most of the, uh, the ads, even the back page ads do not want black males, particularly young guys, because, uh, and they say in the ads, in fact, almost all the girls that I've interviewed, they say that's one of the rules of a pimp, uh, because they're, you know, because they'll be uh, all of a sudden they not want to pay the $130 or the $80 or whatever, and it's too much of a hassle. So the, the Johns are generally based on, because they won't even accept. So they're, they're white males, they like professional businessmen. Um, but best I can do for you. Uh, Brian, another question from upstairs. Um, with the issue of Apple fighting the unlocking of phones, do you think that pimps are now going to upgrade their phones to prevent? Well, they certainly won't give the girls those phones because they're going to have cheap flip phones and disposable. You put money on it uh, to get your time on it. And, uh, you know, maybe the bottom will have a, a, a touchscreen phone. But, um, and the pimp himself, it's gonna be a problem. Okay, and then one more. Um, okay, would mandatory reporting of sex trafficking crimes help? Um, and the question was, does uh, this person ask, don't suburban police departments under-report these type of crimes for things like Cleveland Magazine and re reports like that? Yeah, there was always allegations that, um, a uh, certain city doesn't want to have uh, it be known that there is sex trafficking going on in their city. Uh, the reality of it is, and I try to tell them when I do the few uh, presentations that I'll make to law enforcement is, these pimps, if they think they can get away with it in your city, they're going to your city because they know who's doing the busts in that. So it's the opposite effect. They think that they're trying to protect their, their city, and now all the pimps are going to that city because the cops don't make busts in that city. So uh, I don't know that for sure. I mean, that's a that's a pretty stiff allegation to make that they're uh, intentionally not uh, reporting this for the sake of you know public relations or something. It's usually the places where there's hotels they're off the highway. I mean, that's where the cheap hotels. This is pretty plain and simple, and we know where they are in this city, uh, uh, in Cuyahoga County. <laughs> As a long-term member of law enforcement, um, what do you feel is most effective or is needed to change the perception in law enforcement in particular for victims being victims instead of being, I mean, obviously the law has changed to some extent, but the perception Yes. What do you feel like is most effective or is needed? Great one, great question. Um, because cops have this mentality of the bust and be done with it. Um, but as in the case of, of some of the stuff that I've worked with, with, with uh, police officers, they're seeing, hey, whoa, 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 we make a drug bust on this guy and he's lucky to get, he may get a possession charge. We make a human trafficking charge and this guy's 20 years. Now all of a sudden, hmm, wow, I am more for my uh, time on this one for human trafficking to show that. Uh, you know, they wanted this turnover, turnover and, and roll, but, not, but a guy's gonna walk based on the ticket that they gave him for uh, maybe soliciting prostitution. But you know, human trafficking, this guy is not walking. There's pressure in the court systems, there's minimum 10 years, you know, for each victim. They're starting to realize, but um, I don't know the secret to sit, make that sink other than to actually have these guys partake with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a related question, but I've talked to some police officers that I'm training um, in another part of Ohio, and a lot of times they said even when they think someone's a victim, they'll still charge them with prostitution because there's a perception of, well, they're taking them to a safe place and they're away from the tractor. But as a lawyer, that causes a lot of problems for that person later in life. So what is like, mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of safe places in Ohio, so what do we do about that? Well, uh, what's bizarre about this, and I, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, I've had more than, I've had several victims tell me that they are glad they're in jail. The county jail, I think I would kill myself before I would go to that dump. But uh, it's like staying at the travel lodge. No. 
Um, they're actually glad because they know that they will, they'll have to go through the detox. They want to get off of it. And they have children. They've been taken from them and they want to see those kids. And uh, it, it means a lot to them. They, why they strive to be off the drug and all of a sudden they're in jail so they don't have access to it. They're actually appreciative. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, I love them for wanting that, to be that motivated to want to be in county jail, be off heroin. Um, as far as their record, you know, I, so. They don't want to stay there though, right? No. No, and, and we want to get them, to, and we, get the, we want to get them treatment. And I've taken them out to, uh, uh, driven them out to treatment centers. And, but if they have the option to walk, a lot of times they do because they have the option to walk. What we really need are lockdown facilities that are nice lockdown facilities. And um, because they need, to get, they need to get away from that lifestyle completely. They can't go back to their old neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it would be very rare if someone could go back to their old neighborhood and, and stay off this drive that they have within them. Every time something negative happens to them, they, something triggers and they have to uh, have some more heroin. So you don't want, like I, even my interviews with them were very careful. I said, look, we don't want to, uh, if this is going to trigger you to even talk about it, I didn't even want to talk about it. Um, uh, so I don't know the answer, but well, I, I would think that lockdown facilities that are decent, but someone's going to, who's going to pay for this? Some millionaire has to do this. Um, I don't know. I got a couple of years ago, um, there was a story of a young woman that was snatched off of a bus stop here and, and uh, was crammed into a van and taken to Detroit who escaped. How often are, are women actually kidnapped and trafficked? Well, uh, where I work uh, is with all the investigators that do the cold case rape cases. So I've got like 15 guys that do that stuff. So I'm exposed to that. I've got my own office. Mm -hmm. I'm the only human trafficking guy, but, but um, uh, that's a typical rape scenario is just snagging somebody and, and having them for a period of time and then dumping them out the street. Um, uh, I've worked some pimp that way. I, I've got currently a case where well, actually, she was working for another pimp, but when she went to the call, she was kidnapped by a pimp who drove her to Detroit and, and, and was pimping her out there. Um, I mean, I'm I, sorry, I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> well, in this case, it was, was a schoolgirl who was grabbed uh, in this is happened here in Cleveland, but I uh, heard about it downstate. I just wondered if, if that scenario was... Yeah, I've got a couple cases involving even a bus. How she, they grabbed her from a bus stop. She was waiting. Uh, so according to the Ohio Attorney General, it's about 3% of the people who have been kidnapped. But that has more appeal to the public. But that's what most people think, that that's kidnapping. Right. Those are the cases you hear about. It's outrageous. And so, yeah, you hear about it. You remember it. Anybody else? If we go back to your example of um, the case where you, there was one victim in the front seat and two other victims in the back seat, if that were prosecuted and all three testified, um, could the judge, would the judge sentence to consecutive sentences or? Uh, it's up to the judge, but uh, it's. 10 years minimum per victim. So if I have two underage girls in the back seat, in that case, that's what it was, two underage girls in the back seat, the one on the front seat was an adult woman who was the bottom. She could actually be prosecuted for that. And, and part of the being able to get her to testify is just she's facing potential human trafficking. Now I know she's a victim as well. Okay, but, um, but the two underage girls are in the back seat. The judge could give or you know, well, minimum 10 years per victim. Uh, the hotels seem to be at least tacit participants. You know, they were, especially national model, I mean, they're, they're national chains. Are they helpful assistants? I mean, they, they can't, they obviously don't still on. 
Certainly the national chains, uh, just like I, just, I serve them a subpoena, they give me the records for that date for a particular name they'll check in their computer system. Uh, so I may have, I'm not sure what name it is, but I got the name of the bottom, I got the name of the pimp. It's usually not his name because that's part of his game to not be on paper. Um, and so you try to, then you give them a subpoena and say, uh, I, these, these people stay here for, from between this period and this period, and they'll go through and give you their computer handout and print out. You know, I mean, it's... I mean, but the, the, I, would, I would assume the same people come, I mean, the, 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 the victims, and they're there all the time, and they, they, they have to know what's going on. Well, the chain doesn't. The night desk clerk does. And uh, so I, when I go to these hotels, I, you know, I let them know what I do. And that I'm, I and that I perceive them as victims, and and I'm looking for the pimp who manipulates them, if, and I do my sales job to them. So when they see something, they'll have my card if they remember what they did with it. You know. We're going to take one more question. Okay. What overlap, if any, do you see between um, the human trafficking and homemade pornography videos and with the prevalence of porn everywhere, do you think that there needs to be more legislation regarding porn or more awareness of everything you can find on the internet and whether those people are actually being trafficked? Because obviously with, uh -oh. with children, I mean, it's, you know, per se, um, whatever, it's a crime, but... It, it's not criminalized to watch porn, but how many of those people are being trafficked, and do you believe there needs to be more yeah, awareness? Uh, well, I, when, I, when I worked with Internet Crimes Against Children, and I, I used to work the travelers, you know, the people who would come to have sex with an underage, before it became popular and they did it on television, I was doing it in Middleburg Heights with a, with a, a task force. And um, uh, so anytime you would go do a search at this guy's, you see his computer files and you look at those pictures and some of those pictures are determined to be homemade of which he's looking at 15 years for child pornography home that he produced. That's big. Um, I have never been fortunate enough to take down a large child pornography operation. I mean, as a law enforcement officer, uh, that would be a real catch. That's more of a uh, academic question, I think. <laughs> no, I mean, we talk a lot, especially at our conferences, not just about yes, the need for for more regulation in that area, but also, um, again, kind of going back to the chicken and the egg scenario, the fact that um, there's been a lot of studies done with the way that pornography is so easily accessible now, but also the type of pornography that's accessible now compared to back, at, at least when I was like a kid, and the, that it was much more. Um, it, like neutral. underground or now it's very violent um, uh -oh. the, the mainstream pornography is violent and so we we talk a lot of our conferences about um when they interview john um in john schools and things like that and interviews him a lot there's a lot of addiction to porn um and the fact that like, what are the relationships there and um now we're raising our kids in a society where it's so accessible and they're seeing that that kind of dehumanization of women as kind of mainstream instead of at least when I was a kid and you know it was like oh is there a Playboy magazine where there might be one new picture of a woman and um, so it's like the changes in our society and how that might be also feeding into the growth of this overall economy so absolutely there's there's links I think in many ways certainly the validation of someone who's into some deviance uh, he finds others that are also into that deviance and they validate each other's um, addiction. Uh, and and so that is where the internet hurts. You know. So we're gonna go ahead and take um, a quick break. We'll come back together in about 10 minutes. And there's